Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. My name is Blair or the Illuminati and today I'm going to be talking about a pretty heavily requested topic, the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts. I actually did look into the Girl Scouts a bit once before and they weren't quite as terrible as I thought, so I actually scrapped the idea altogether. Now the Boy Scouts on the other hand, that's another issue entirely. Now, this isn't me saying that the Girl Scouts are perfect or anything like that because they are far from it, but there's this weird mix of the two both being bad and separate, but together, but have very bad issues. So I, it's kind of hard to unravel them one at a time. So we're just gonna combine it and put them both together. Just think of this as a Scouts video and it's just the combination of the two. So I already know because there's some of you that are very dedicated for or against the Scouts, doesn't matter what side you fall on, but this is gonna kind of be a combination of both. I know I'm not gonna be able to get to every single issue with your specific troop or whatever the heck it is, but I'm gonna try my best to get to the big talking points. So with that being said, let's dive right in and see what makes these organizations not as sweet as their cookies or popcorn, and in some cases, very dangerous. Let's get into it. The Girl Scouts began in 1912 after Juliet Gordon Lowe met Sir Robert Baden Powell, the founder of the Scout movement. The Boy Scouts had only been around for two years at this time, so the idea of scouting in general was very new and very popular. It might sound a bit weird to think of scouting as trendy, but it really was thanks to Baden Powell. According to the Boy Scouts of America and website, he served in the British army from 1876 until 1910 in India and Africa. In 1899, during the Second Boer War in South Africa, Baden Powell successfully defended the town in the siege of Mafeking. A Boer army in excess of 8,000 men surrounded him and his troops. Although wholly outnumbered, the garrison withstood the siege for 217 days, and much of this is attributable to some of the cunning military deceptions instituted at Baden Powell's behest as commander of the garrison. As a result, Baden Powell became a national hero back home. On his return home, Baden Powell found that his military training manual, Aids to Scouting, had become something of a bestseller and was used by teachers and youth organizations. Following a meeting with the founder of the Boys Brigade, Sir William Smith, Baden Powell decided to rewrite Aids to Scouting to suit a youth readership, and in 1907 held a camp on Brown Sea Island for 22 boys of mixed social background to test out some of his ideas, which is now seen as the beginning of the scouting movement. King Henry VII encouraged this movement. It inspired the founder of the Girl Scouts, its history, and it's honestly kind of impressive. Even though the Girl Scouts were originally segregated and by no means, so I want to dismiss that, but they did grow with the times. Well before social barriers began to fall in the South in 1956, Martin Luther King Jr. called Girl Scouts a force for desegregation. Girls of all backgrounds were encouraged to learn woodcraft, nature, camping, in a time when it may not have been all that feminine to do so. Juliet mixed girls of different economic classes to fish, to grow, to learn. And as you might be most familiar with, to sell cookies. They've been selling cookies since 1917, and as their website puts it, from buying a bulletproof vest for a female police officer to creating care packages for patients at a local children's cancer center, girls nationwide use their cookie revenue to fund projects that benefit their communities in amazing ways. All this sounds well and good, and I'm happy to read about a company history that isn't based on lies and deceit like I often do. On the surface, this seems fantastic, but then where's the issue? Why am I making this video? Well, it all starts with the cookies. There's a very, very, very fine line between kids raising money for a good cause and kids being pressured to sell for a company to the point of, well, child labor. And according to some, the Girl Scouts have actually crossed that line. Now, before we get into this section, I'm going to put a gigantic disclaimer out there and say that this probably won't be true of everyone's Girl Scout experience. Some of you might really identify with this and some of you may have felt that this was too intense and bordered on child labor. Hell, some of you might think I'm crazy for even suggesting this or bringing this up at all. I'm going to do my best to present both sides of the argument, so bear with me. Child labor in of itself isn't just working without pay. Otherwise, emptying chores would be classified as child labor, and I don't want to use such a loose definition for such a serious topic. Instead, it's defined as work that deprives children of their childhood, their potential, and their dignity, and that is harmful to physical and mental development. 
Again, I really don't want to throw this term around, especially after we used it to talk about the mines in India and the children gathering mica there. However, multiple sources online have compared the Girl Scouts to child labor, so let's see why. One article by Brian Penny from 2018 is entitled Girl Scout Cookies, How Slave Labor and Gender Inequality Became a Winning Combo. He starts by saying that Girl Scouts as a company earns $89 million in revenue every year, and about half of that is its annual dues. Boy Scouts, on the other hand, have a revenue of $244 million because their annual dues are about $113 million. Boy Scouts also received 68 million in pledge donations, whereas Girl Scouts had less than 4 million. The point is they're reliant on these cookie sales. Girl Scouts aren't issued a paycheck for their work. They do it to serve the community and are given a variety of badges by the National Girl Scouts of America Council, along with sales incentives from the local troop. The girls keep 21% in their pocket, said Sarah Danzinger, communications director at the Girl Scouts of Minnesota and Wisconsin River Valleys, though this number can vary for different troops. For each Girl Scout cookie sold, an average of 10 to 15% of the proceeds goes to the local troop, 50% goes to the local council, and the remainder is returned to the manufacturer to cover production cost. Badges include Cookie Count, Smart Cookie, The Cookie Connection, Cookie Biz, and Cookies and Dough. These badges are awarded to girls who excel at skills like teamwork, organization, planning, communication, and goal setting. Local Girl Scout troops arrange incentives ranging from stuffed animals to free travel for top sellers, though many girls opt to give the proceeds back to the local troop. Even though the title of this article seems like it's about to dive straight into some serious situations with child labor, that's not really the case. Brian states that every box of Girl Scouts cookies goes right back into the community and he's bought several boxes himself. So where are all the articles that are calling it child labor? Well, the ones I found referenced were, to put it bluntly, pretty over the top. And seriously, they call it a menace to society and say stuff like this. Yes, yes, I know. There are people who will swear that they think these cookies are delicious edibles eagerly awaited each year. But let us recall that there are some Jewish prisoners in Nazi concentration camps who were reluctant to leave their horrific compounds at the end of World War II. People become irrationally attached to all sorts of repugnant things, such as, to choose another random example, the sound of marching band music. And we must discount their deranged testimony and truthfully report that Girl Scout cookies are basically unremarkable and unappealing. I mean, with words like repugnant, deranged, I mean, I didn't know someone could hate cookies this much. The article states that the Girl Scouts knocking door to door isn't prudent because of assault. Though the Girl Scout safety rules do state that an adult should be accompanying the children. Whether or not this is always followed, I can't say. But every time a Girl Scout troop knocks at my door, there's always an adult present. But Girl Scouts do make it clear they don't condone the children selling cookies alone for their own safety. And seriously, he writes, I'm not going to buy any of your disgusting cookies and you need to stop importuning people about this and instead devise some honest way to raise money for your organization. And if enough people learn to just say no to this vile national addiction, maybe we can finally force the Girl Scouts to change the crummy way they now do business. God, I just hate that this person thought saying crummy way to do business was like their big punchline, their big aha moment, like gotcha. I'm terrible at puns and even I know that's a bad pun. But anyway, there's very little being said about their supposed crummy business. So like at this point, I was really no closer to being able to confidently say, yes, the Girl Scout selling cookies is child labor. Thankfully, I found yet another source that claims Girl Scouts are proof we need to change child labor laws. It reads the following. The Girl Scout cookie program teaches young girls how to be entrepreneurs. It teaches them how to work. It is, after a fashion, child labor. The great scandal is not that Girl Scouts are promoting child labor. It's that there isn't more child labor in the United States today. When one says the words child labor, of course, one immediately thinks of the crushing 14 hour textile style jobs, pictures ones you can usually see in middle school history textbooks. Surely young children are better off when they are not required to labor under such working conditions. In the zeal to give children healthier and happier childhoods, we have wrongfully convinced ourselves that the law, not wealth, is the better determinant. 
As a result, we have allowed ourselves to outlaw nearly every effective kind of labor for an entire class of Americans. This is wrong. If goal setting, decision making, money management, people skills, and business ethics are worthwhile pursuits for the Girl Scouts, they should be good enough for any kid who has the ability and the drive to make something of himself, even at a young age. So in other words, this article isn't arguing that Girl Scouts are forcing kids into child labor, but the opposite, that the Girl Scouts teach children to be entrepreneurs and the American laws are hindering it. I was pretty surprised to read this honestly, but I can kind of see where this article is coming from too, at least in the sense of teaching kids entrepreneurship and that they aren't learning these things in school. The amount of people calling Girl Scouts child labor is less than I thought at least. One satire article from the Medium says that apparently lots of you seem to find this particular form of child labor cute. For example, I recently visited the Upright Citizens Brigade Training Center in Los Angeles. What did I see? A large table piled high with six to 10 tasting cookies created by the Pillsbury Corporation and staffed by a gaggle of nearly bored child workers. The little biscuit serfs were so bad at their jobs that the adult overseer spent a great deal of the time admonishing them for inefficient workflows, improper cash handling procedures, and a generally unfocused selling attitude. I saw it for what it was, a member of the managerial class correctly rebuking her lazy entitled workers. Yet most people around me found this charming. Why, if I'd employed a raft of urchin miners and cursed at them for poor pick heaving and ore sorting, I'd surely be painted a villain. How in the hell do the Girl Scouts get away with it? Again, although this is satire and the writer made it clear he was joking around, some people really do argue that the Girl Scouts are exploiting kids with Girl Scout cookies. I mean, if a troop leader is truly overworking anyone, I can absolutely see and agree with that point of view. But the Girl Scouts as a whole, I can't call it child labor, not by a long shot. I know I haven't gotten into any real dirt yet, but I wanted to address this, especially because a lot of the requests that I saw that were asking me to cover this topic specifically mentioned the Girl Scouts and child labor. Again, if you've had an absolutely horrible experience with Girl Scouts in terms of them pushing you to sell more and work long hours with your mom, dad, or you know whatever the situation is, I'm not going to diminish that or dismiss that. But the largest child labor issues I've found has been about the palm oil used in their cookies and not from the company or the Girl Scouts themselves. Now, the other comment I've seen a lot of people make about the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts is far more serious in nature, and that's covering up pedophilia. When I looked up Girl Scout sexual assault cases, what I found, despite my search, was a truly alarming and gut-wrenching situation over on the Boy Scout side of things. But we will start with the Girl Scouts and work our way there. Now, on their Wikipedia page, Girl Scouts has a few controversies listed. Some people have strongly supported them being against Planned Parenthood and they've had the words to serve God in the Girl Scout pledge and it was there until a policy change in the 90s, like things like that. But it's how they handle cases of sexual assault that's far more pressing. In 2012, a Bellingham, Washington Girl Scout volunteer was sentenced to three years in prison for the sexual abuse of a teenager and asking another minor girl to text nude photos of herself. The defendant, Andrea Costa Ruiz, was sentenced to three years in state prison for the crime. Meanwhile, the Girl Scouts issued a statement assuring the public they are doing everything they can to protect their members from these incidents. However, a similar story from Kissimmee, Florida, suggests there is a pattern of this behavior in the nationwide organization. Eight girls reported they were molested by their Girl Scouts leader, David Wayne Fisher. The girls were between the ages 10 to 11 at the time and were assaulted during a camping trip to Walt Disney World's Fort Wilderness Resort. Fisher is now serving a 15 year sentence in state prison. Fisher had previously served as a substitute teacher with a local school district, but was asked not to return due to inappropriate behavior with the students. Cross the nation. Girl Scout chapters and other youth organizations maintain clear and firm policies that prohibit any form of child abuse and neglect. The organization also maintains strict reporting policies in the event of suspected abuse. Any employee or volunteer who believes a child has been the victim of sexual assault or abuse must immediately report the incident to local authorities. Not only is there a criminal element to these cases, but there is also a civil element. 
According to California personal injury, law abuse, assault, and molestation victims may be entitled to benefits and financial compensation for their injuries, pain, suffering, and medical issues, both physical and psychological. Both the Girl Scouts organization and the public school district can and should be held responsible for failing to protect the children in their care from sexual predators. In cases like this, there are more legal options available to the victim and or victim's family than you may be aware. These liable parties can and should be held responsible for their negligence. In all crimes involving the sexual assault of a minor, both criminal and civil suits can be filed. I can't fault the Girl Scouts for hiring someone that turned out to be a criminal and a despicable person. However, what I can fault them for is if they didn't do their proper research and background checks into these people, then allowed them near children and how they handled the cases that followed. And that's where the Girl Scouts have failed. ABC News reported recently, only August 5th, 2020, that Weiss Russell, 48 of Syracuse, is accusing the organization of failing to protect her from a man described as a volunteer co-troop leader when she became a scout at age 11 in the mid 1980s. Freeman said the Girl Scouts organization violated its own policies at the time by allowing the man whose wife co-led the troop to be involved with her troop. In the church basement, the man would make her touch him sexually according to the lawsuit, which also accuses him of raping her. The abuse continued even after the abuser's wife was alerted to her husband's misconduct, Weiss Russell's lawyers say. I feared him, she said. He threatened to harm her and her family if she reported him, and he was always telling me that no one would believe me anyway, she said. Around the time she was 18 and a few years removed from the scouts, Weiss Russell finally revealed to her mother what had happened, she said. She later tried to report the man to prosecutors, but was informed the statute of limitations had run out. More recently, a counselor encouraged her to take advantage of the Child Victims Act as a way to get closure. Girl Scouts of the USA is aware of a complaint that was filed in New York alleging that a Girl Scout was harmed in the 1980s during Girl Scout activities, the organization said in a statement. At Girl Scouts, there is nothing we take more seriously than the safety and well being of our girls, and we maintain rigorous safety protocols. We are looking into this complaint and will address the matter with the utmost care and concern. Weiss Russell says she still runs into her alleged abuser who lives near her in Syracuse. She recalled how he once approached her at a gas station and put his hand on her shoulder while saying hello. I froze up like the child, like the child I was when he was victimizing me, like I had no power, she said. He still to this day has power over me and I'm hoping through all this, he won't have power over me. This has had such a horrible lasting effect on this woman's life. And yet so much of this pain could have been prevented if someone took her seriously ages ago. And I am furious about this, but not all that surprised that the man's wife didn't listen and she probably dismissed it as nonsense. There's other cases too, a recent one from just a few months ago, also coming out of New York. And while there's multiple cases, whether it's molestation, child pornography, or sexual abuse in regards to the Girl Scouts, it's unfortunately all the more prevalent among the Boy Scouts. It's only been within the past couple years that everything's truly come to a head for the Boy Scouts. In fact, they even filed for bankruptcy. And just while researching this video, I must have gotten half a dozen ads for law firms investigating the Boy Scouts when playing YouTube videos in the background. As horrific as what happened to the children and victims at the Girl Scouts, the coverups don't seem to be to quite this extent. Both are horrendous. It's just almost overwhelming how many sources I have for the Boy Scouts in this situation. For example, the BSA said filing for chapter 11 bankruptcy is only one option under consideration as it responds to growing legal costs and other financial pressures. Christopher Hurley, the lawyer for 11 former scouts who accused disgraced scoutmaster Thomas Hacker of sexually abusing them and sued the BSA for damages, said that if the organization does seek chapter 11 protection, it won't be the fault of the victims. Hurley said that the BSA's insurers are arguing the doctrine of intended consequences to avoid paying settlements. As to explain, Hurley said, that means if you, the insured, took actions that made an event take place like arson, the insurance companies don't have to pay. In the case of Hacker, Hurley said, the doctrine of intended consequence does not apply because the BSA actually banned him from scouting in the 1970s when they learned he was molesting children. But they were grossly negligent in enforcing that ban, Hurley said. So the guy easily got back into scouting multiple times. He was a two-time convicted pedophile and he molested another 35 boys. 
Hacker was the leader of Troop 1600 based in the St. Louis de Montfort Church in suburban Chicago. He was convicted in 1989 of five counts of aggravated criminal assault against three scouts who were between the ages of 11 and 13 years old and sentenced to two concurrent 50-year prison terms. Dubbed the most prolific molester in scouting in the 1995 book, Scouts Honor, Sexual Abuse in America's Most Trusted Institution, Hacker, who was in his 80s, died behind bars on June 21st, said Lindsay Hess of the Illinois Department of Corrections. Now, if this was one or two cases in the 70s, it probably wouldn't be such a prevalent issue when this article was written. This goes far, far deeper than just Thomas Hacker. Over 20,000 pages of allegations of child abuse in the Boy Scouts from 1965 to 1985 exist. It's been dubbed the perversion files and it's horrific to say the least. The allegations of abuse could very well be the downfall for the BSA, said Steve Siebold, author of Sex, Politics, Religion, How Delusional Thinking is Destroying America. It's bad enough that this alleged abuse went on in the first place, but the fact that the Boy Scouts organization tried to sweep it under the table for so many years is equally as troubling, he says via email. This from a group that claims to be one of the nation's most prominent values-based organizations. What values does this teach our kids or anyone else for that matter? And what a downfall it's proving to be. Accounts of scoutmasters touching themselves prompted quiet dismissals from Boy Scouts back in the day, but no police report. I can't vouch for how they would truly handle these accusations today in 2020, but their gross negligence for these children's safety is certainly catching up to them. A group of attorneys was able to collect information from over 428 men and boys whose accounts of rape, molestation, and abuse indicate the Boy Scouts pedophile problem is far more widespread than the organization has previously acknowledged. They were reporting that they were a wholesome organization, says Tim Kosnoff, one of the attorneys, when they were kicking out child molesters at the rate of one every two days for every 100 years. That quotation alone fucking does it for me. I fully recognize that child predators can slip through the cracks of a background check every once in a while, and sometimes they work at schools, but they put themselves in positions to be around children, and it's dark shit, honestly. But the fact that there were this many abusers really does make me sick. How the fuck can you call yourself wholesome? And then this is also a gigantic problem in your organization. That's when you take the system and you burn it to the ground and you start over again. You make some new rules, more thorough checks, demand that no one can be alone with the scoutmasters, just something. I don't specialize in making rules to handle this list since obviously I was never a Boy Scout and I can't claim to know exactly what would have been best to stop this problem. But Boy Scouts did absolutely nothing to even acknowledge it existed in the first place. And it's similar to another issue of theirs actually. The Boy Scouts apparently used to take a boys will be boys approach when it came to bullying and adult leaders felt that bullying toughened someone up. It wasn't until July of 1987 when one Boy Scout was severely beaten in his sleep that the Boy Scouts thought, gee, maybe we should address this. Now, decades later, the damage has been more than done. The Boy Scouts are finally starting to change their ways and it's a little too late. And by that, I mean, it's a lot too late. As much as it churned my stomach, I took a look at some of these perversion files and the, God damn it. The very fucking line of this was that a predator was named in 14 count indictment with subject at file CONF 001462 for endangering the welfare of children and aggravated sexual assault and making terroristic threats belonged to a cult. (sighs) Like, okay, I knew it was gonna be bad, right? But this just, I wasn't prepared to read that. There's rub downs called an attitude adjustment, luring troops to remote areas to molest them. A district training chairman that resigned after allegedly molesting three different camp staff. Many of these boys were 14 years old. Some were charged with sodomy for those as young as 12. And there's even one ex-police officer. The list just goes on and on. Getting scouts drunk and then molesting them and molesting a 12 year old nephew and having violent temper tantrums and keeping guns in the house. This isn't just inappropriate language or an occasional pervert slipping through the cracks. This is consistent despicable behavior. 
Oh, and if you need something else to get your blood boiling, it's worth noting that the Boy Scouts had a ban in place on gay men being scoutmasters until 2015. And yet behind closed doors, the perversion files continue to grow. Could it get much more raid inducing than that? Now, don't get me wrong, the Girl Scouts have had some catching up on their own to do in terms of accepting the LGBTQ plus community within their own ranks. But around the same time, the Girl Scouts actually refunded a $100,000 donation because the donor stipulated that the Girl Scouts should refuse entry to transgender girls. So at least in that regard, they were ahead of the Boy Scouts, although the standard is really low on that. The serious dramatic language that article used to talk about their intense hatred for Girl Scout cookies seems far more applicable here if you ask me. Time Magazine goes as far to compare the Boy Scouts case to the Catholic Church sex abuse scandal. The Catholic Church faced more than 10,000 accusations of child abuse in the US between 1950 and 2002. The court case dragged on for years, and to this day, there's a long lasting effect and negative implication that surrounds the Catholic Church because of it. A child abuse expert hired testified in court she found over 12,000 reports of sexual abuse at the hands of 7,800 suspected assailants between 1944 and 2016. Academics say that could be a gross underestimation as well, as many boys could have been intimidated or shamed out of reporting their assailants. Studies show that survivors of child sex abuse are at an increased risk of psychological and physical ailments ranging from PTSD to depression, drug abuse, diabetes, heart attack, and stroke. The lawyers say many of their clients have turned to drugs or alcohol or even crime to cope with their past. Imagine being sodomized as a seven-year-old and trying to process that, says Kosnoff. It's a ticking time bomb in your soul. It just erodes a person from the inside out. Experts say boys struggle with such a violation of trust differently than girls do. Eli Neuberger, a pediatrician who studied child abuse at Boston Children's Hospital and who has testified in cases involving pedophilia in the Boy Scouts, says men tend to disclose instances of assault at a much later age than women. There is a stigma of coming forward for both men and women, he says, but unfortunately for men, there is this extra shame that you have that you are not able to protect yourself, that you were found to be powerless. He adds that in certain parts of the country, men who were abused by men additionally fear coming forward and facing homophobia, even if, or especially if, they do not identify as queer. Again, this isn't to say that there aren't stories like these coming out of the Girl Scouts. I know I've said that already, but I feel the need to make it abundantly clear that I'm not trying to turn into this whose trauma is worse kind of thing. But from what I've found, it's more of a case by case basis within the Girl Scouts. Whereas in the Boy Scouts, the abuse has been even more systemic. A 60 year old Massachusetts man who says he and several boys in his troop were assaulted and raped over a dozen times in the woods by a scoutmaster when they were teenagers still cringes when someone he does not know comes too close. Even to this day, I don't like strangers touching me at all. Even on the shoulder, says the man who did not want to be identified. I jerked away. A 17 year old from Michigan is still struggling to process the abuse. He says his scoutmaster targeted him around the age of seven, just as his parents had separated and he was at his most vulnerable. He did stuff below the torso area if you catch my drift, he says. None of this is to diminish anyone's experience as a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout. If you do feel like you've sat around being pressured to sell cookies all day, I'm not surprised. Girl Scouts do really seem to care about those cookie sales quite a bit and for obvious reasons. Or if you were a Boy Scout and you had an amazing troop leader and went on some incredible camping trips as a child, that's awesome too. I can understand why some people flippantly call it child labor because yeah, It does put a lot of pressure on kids to sell cookies, but I don't want to use those terms lightly on my channel either. As long as it's more of a lemonade stand for a good cause type of situation, rather than I have to meet these sales quotas and I'm only 10 years old, I'm not terribly upset by it. At the end of the day, it's hard to get into because everyone I'm sure has their own experience depending on their troop leader or scout master. It's not like one of these terrible charities like KWN or how bad a company is being operated. Regardless, I know you guys have been asking for this for quite a while and I can't really say I hope you enjoyed the video, but I do hope you learned something from it. 
whether you are or were a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout and whether you enjoyed your time there or you did not, the end of the day is these things are things that happened, things that are being talked about regarding both the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts and just be careful, honestly. So with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's video. If you're new here, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Make sure to like the video as well. If you want to see more content from me, make sure to click open that description box. You're gonna find links to all of my second channels, social media, all of that good stuff. So thank you guys for watching. I love you so much and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys. Mm-hmm.